this presentation is supposed to be light and fun, not so many lines of codes, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's more intuitive. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, um, structure predictions. Um, basically, when you're doing a classification or regression, your question, the question you're, you're asking your computer or your model is very simple. Yes or no, give me the label of this, give me the real value of that. I know the, the answer is usually, usually one number, scalar, right? In structural prediction, when your answer is like something more complex, it's a structure, it's a vector of numbers, a vector of a, it's something more, com more complex. For example, eBay, when eBay looks at the picture, eBay is a really, I work at I work at I work at eBay right now. So where, when eBay is looking at picture, they come to me and say, "Tell me what in this tell me what is inside this picture." So I need to say, "Hey, this is a black tennis shoe, or this is a black high heel shoe." But if we say that this is a black tennis high heel shoe, they would look at me and say, "Are you sure? High heel tennis shoe?" I, I, are you okay with your head? <laughs> so whenever your uh, label space has low probability uh, combinations, this is where structure, this, this implies that you have structure in your label space. This is exactly what we're, we are going to talk in this lecture, right? Um, exploiting structure not, on, not only in the input space, but on, also in the label space, right? This, this is exactly what I'm, Referring when I say structure prediction. All right, this is just one example of what we are doing at eBay. For example, background removal is one kind of structure predictions because the output is not a single scalar; it's an image. It's an image, right? Whenever your output is complex, images by all means is complex has complex structure. Some images are looks to us very natural; some of them does not, right? So whenever you have structure in your output, this is one example, you will need to do some kind of structure predictions, right? So what can you do with structure predictions? A lot of cool stuff, much more cooler than classification or regression. For example, this is like color painting, black to white to color. This is like edge to real image, and this is like OCR, but for whole world, world, okay? You take image and you need to output a world. Sometimes your OCR won't recognize each character correctly, but he will look at the dictionary and see what, what makes sense. For example, this, this is the example. <laughs> um, yeah. So where can we find the semantic segmentation? Again, almost everything. I mean, Google drives autonomous cars using segmentation, segmentation is structure predictions. So almost everything, it's very applicable. And we are going to talk about semantic segmentation as a canonical example of structural predictions, just because it's super applicable for a vision, for the vision industry. Okay, this is like, it's not solved by a long shot, but it's super applicable. You can drive cars, you can fly drones, you can do anything. And the first step with all this stuff is like understanding your, th your scene. And looking at the pixel is much more harder than looking at, at a label, labeled uh, image. Right? Because the car does not need to know anything more than here is my road, there are some people over there, this is a, a sidewalk, you should not drive on a sidewalk. And this is more than enough. I mean, the blur thing on the right is more than enough for you to drive a car. This is what it says. And Google d does a pretty good job driving an autonomous car using only this data. They don't look at the pixels. Not at all, right? So what we'll do today? We'll do a problem definition of semantic segmentation, not just structure prediction, but in particular, semantic segmentation. And we'll go from just really um, unusable, a uh, very old, naive uh, solutions, and walk our way towards a uh, state-of-the-art solutions. Um, we will start with the Onari solutions. We will talk about what it is in a few minutes, 
And later on, we will talk about CRF. And la last, we will talk about GAN. And we will try to formulate some connection between CRF and GANs. I, I think all of us can feel that they are solving the same problem with different methods. And we will try to touch this, uh, this point. This is like the, the climax of this uh, lecture. <laughs> All right, so problem definition. Given an image, I want you to tell me for each pixel what it is. Is it background, is it a horse, is it a human? And semantic segmentation in particular, saying that I have a closed set, I have a fixed set of uh, labels, and I want each pixel to be one of these uh, labels, right? So as opposed to generic segmentation, semantic segmentation is a closed set, so it's, Basically, a classification problem for each pixel, right? But, so let's start with the super naive, super obvious uh, solution. I mean, don't try this at home. <laughs> um, K-means. K-means, exactly, color-based. Let's say that I want to look at a pixel and say something smart about this pixel based on its, on its color, right? The sky is blue, so, the, the dumb thing to do is like say, everything blue is sky. <laughs> this is exactly what K-means does, right? It says the sky, blue, the sky is blue, everything's blue is sky. This is like segmenting the color space into two, into two uh, colors. You see that even in this really nice image, it gets it wrong, it, it gets it wrong. Because the sky is not always blue and not everything blue is sky. And no, no matter how hard you try, you will get noise. You'll get some outliers here and here, pixels, some weird pixels that says, okay, this, this guy right here is a building. If, even in this like super easy picture, this, this really naive algorithm will say, that, it will say to you that this blob right here, this small thing right here is a building. No, I can. S you, we all can see that this is not true. Just looking at the image, just looking at the label. If even we were just looking at the labels, we see that there is no building floating in the sky, right? And so, I mean, what can you do? Better things. I need more context. I mean, I need to to look wider at the input space. So people came up with the different of algorithms. This is like, this name of this algorithm is Slick, right? And it uh, segments your image to, into super pixels, all right? It, it uh, groups similar pixels together, and then your job is to say something smart about a group of pixels, about super pixels, right? So what is the label? This is, this is, the, this is, name, this is now my uh, problem definition. What is the label? B giving the label, giving some super pixel. Giving the Y, giving some super pixel fix, right? Uh, and, and still you have a lot of uns unsolved issues beca because you can group pixels like really wide or middle or really small. If you do it too small, you don't have enough context. If you do it too wide, you get errors, you get uh, some noise into the super pixels. And you just, you need to do it just right. So this this method works okay, okay. It's not it's not even close to state of the art, but it was a huge leap based on the k-means or the color-based. Uh, uh, I don't I don't even call it algorithm. <laughs> it's just it's just some progress, and it's still far from being being something useful, right? So just to illustrate. Here is, for example, a super pixel. I cut it down. I, I, we can. Can anybody guess what it is? And again, again, a part for the man who knows what it is. <laughs> right. So right now, can you see what it is? Yeah. But I gave him more context. Right. I gave him more context, but additional noise. I gave you some a whole lot more context, but much more noise. It looks like a blob of black and, white, black and white image to me. I don't see what it is. But when I give you just the right context, you can see that this is Dalmatian dog. For those of you who don't see it, here is the face, here is the legs, and this is the bottom. <laughs> so 
Adding context is supposed to be like super uh, precise because you don't want to add too much context because you add noise. And if, if you have too little context, you don't know what it is, right? So this is the main intuition. And this is like within rewards, which is what I said. All right. So let's go to the deep learning era, right? Deep learning, like, most of, I mean, think most of you for the vision industry knows, knows this article, knows the, this article, FCN, right? Um, but let's, let's talk about first what, uh, how deep learning uh, looks at the picture. All right. Every time that you do convolution and max pooling, your your uh, more deeper layer can have a bigger bigger receptive fields, right? For for example, these pixels, this pixel right here, is looking at this rectangle in the middle layer, and if every pixel in this middle layer is looking at this uh, rectangle in the image, right? So this pixel over here, just single pixel over here, has a lot of receptive fields in the original image. Okay, you can you you all get it, right? Each pixel in the more deeper layer can see a whole lot of pixels in the input layers, right? So what FCN does basically, it gets it takes it takes the the input image and just do convolution and convolution and max pooling, convolution and max pooling until it, until it gets some 4096 uh, feature vectors of a single pixel, all right? Each, each pixel over here can look, potentially can look on the entire image, but because of the non-linearity and because of the radius, most of the image is blacked, blacked out. So it, it basically this 4096 uh, feature vectors just divided your image into super pixels, right? Do you all understand why? I mean, this is exactly what it does. Every pixel here, you have 4,096 pixels, which means you divided your input image into 4,096 super pixels, roughly speaking, right? And now, all, he, all, all that it le left to do, to do is just open up these 4,096 uh, feature vectors into full image and give label to each pixel. But each, each, uh, each of the 4,000 uh, 4, feature vectors is looking at a specific part of the image. So you just applying a label to each super pixel. This is basically the same. OK? Yes. They do share. They do share. They do share. They do share. Yeah, they do share some regions because but what, what the intuition said that each uh, pixel is looking at a certain uh, part of the image and this part alone, it doesn't have to be continuous, it doesn't have to be that it's not overlapping, it does overlap but in its, most of the time it's not continuous, right? But it, you divided, you shattered your image into 4096 super pixels. And instead of uh, some smart guy telling you, okay, this is the super pixel that my algorithm, this is my smart algorithm, super smart algorithm that divided the image into, I don't know, some super pixels, this is done automatically by backpropagation. Right? This is the main intuition about this work. Right? But it still does not look at the label space at all. I mean, flying cows, okay? Flying cows will be perfectly natural for FCN. He wouldn't raise an eyebrow. He wouldn't care less. He would look at the image, split it into super pixels, say, "Here is a cow. I don't care what the background is. If it do, if it does, if it does a good job, well, well, perfect." But most of the time, it hallucinates, hallucinates some uh, small blobs in the sky and say, "This is a person," and all everything around it is sky and and, and just two by two a uh, blob of person or road in the sky. I mean, it doesn't look at the label context. And this is the Unari solution kilo. The Unari, every Unari solution, every, every solution that looks only on the input space and doesn't look at the 
at the labels that his fellow pixels uh, try to uh, predict will, will fall into this pit, right? They, they, will, they will all have the same um, disadvantage, right? So Unami solutions are limited. This is what I'm trying to say. No matter how how do you try, All right? So let's go further to the real practical state of the art solution, which is uh, conditional random fields, right? Conditional random fields are consi uh, consist of two loss functions. First of all, is the Unari solution, right? If, just as we talked before, you try to do, you try to look at the wide context of the Im Im image, right? And they and then say something smart of the about this uh, super pixel or about this region, right? And then you have the pairwise potential, the pairwise loss. The pairwise loss says that if you have two very similar pixels that are very close together, close apart in the spatial sense, they should have the same label. Right, and if they don't have the same label, you get will you will get penalized for that. You will get penalty for that. So this is pairwise potential in one sentence, and you can see here that this is like groundbreaking work by Philip K. I mean, I have his full name over here, um, Philip Can. Bull, <laughs> I don't know how to read it, but this is work from 2011, and this is like ground groundbreaking uh, thing. Thing. This is from his paper, um, and you can see, and you can see that for this input, which is uh, not, uh, it's it's not trivial to get all the pixels in the trees just right. Right. Both this CRF, th this is a relaxation of CRF. This is like a robust. Uh, P to the power of n CRF. This is like smooth CRF. It's 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 less accurate, but you can see that the accurate CRFs, okay, CRF uh, done the uh, inference done with the uh, uh, Monte Chain Monte Carlo uh, process or a uh, Philip works get the details just right. Every every uh, leaf on this uh, pine tree get they get it just right. Right. The difference between between these two, right that this one took 36 hours to uh, calculate, and this Philip uh, work was done in 0 0.2 seconds. Right? So this is like bringing CRF to something very practical. And for example, if you recall the um, Google car slide from the, the, if you call the Google car slide, all they did is like they took FCN, get the Unami potentials, and then uh, employed uh, Philip uh, CRF on top of the sonar potentials and got something really reasonable. It, w it was state of the art until three years ago. And then people just did something better, as usual. <laughs> um, so CRF uh, consists of, as we said, from two loss functions, the Unari potential and the pairwise potentials, right? The pairwise potentials is something uh, that it's a little bit hard to define because uh, you have two pixels. Some sometimes they do they do have the same label. Sometimes they don't have the same label. And then you have to decide whether cow in the sky is something that uh, you used to see or cow in the grass is something that you used to see. And whether uh, doing an arrow that a super pixel of a cow is next to a grass is the same weight is the same. Uh, it has the same loss as a superpixel of a cow next to a superpixel of a sky. And people most of the time don't do that because it's really complicated and they just uh, came up with the POTS uh, model. The POTS model said that if these two pixels are very similar and close apart and they did have the same label in the ground truth labeling, you are penalized equally, regardless of what is your error. So they, the POTS model does not differentiate between a cow in the sky and cow in the grass. It just captured that two pixels of the same cow should be two pixels of the same cow, period. They don't differentiate between the type of loss, right? And again, 
the POTS model. It, this is just a binary uh, loss, zero, one. It doesn't care about the context. It doesn't, as, as we said, go flying birds versus flying cows, it penalizes the same for both, right? Um, again, CRF was low until 2011. And if you want a Python library that can give you a CRF pretty much out of the box with a fast implementation, you can use PyStruct. I just put that here. And if you feel that your problem has structure in the label space, I mean, if you're saying that uh, black tennis shoes is something <laughs> that, uh, that you're uh, if you're saying that this image is a black tennis shoes and your boss come to you and say, what did you drink for, <laughs> for breakfast? <laughs> uh, you should use a price talk as a, as a, as a first uh, a solution. OK, so let's move on to GAN. Five minutes? Just what I have? Four minutes? Fuck. <laughs> um, so let's get really started. How many of you know GAN? OK, it's not enough. <laughs> um, actually, GAN is like formulating a loss function with just minimax game. OK, you have two players, one that try to generate images and one that try to differentiate between real and, and fake images. Um, the generator images, you can think about, about the G function and all the G net as trying to do structure prediction. And the DNet, the discriminator net, uh, the, the one that tried to differentiate between the real and fake images, uh, the one that actually learns ab about what is real and what is fake. And by this process, he tells the generator network how to generate more real, realistic images. And realistic images is exactly the structure that you want in the label space. I mean, if the discriminator sees high heel black tennis shoes, and you say, something is wrong here. This doesn't seem right. All right? And he propagates the, the, these signals to the generator networks. The generator networks learns that high heels and the tennis shoes doesn't go together. OK? This is, like, this is the exact supervision that uh, CRF uh, is trying to capture, but it does it data-driven. You don't have to uh, model anything. Right? So. Why using GAN? Basically, because it works. The next slide is why, why you shouldn't use GAN. So <laughs> this is the, like the pros, not the cons. Uh, because it actually removes all these uh, all error signals. You see that you have a sky. You have a, a somewhat noisy sky with a lot of clouds. This is the ground truth. The sky is sky. And the unary potentials, from time to time, see something in the sky, some, see some object in the sky. The, the GAN or the pairwise potential, or the, I don't know how they want to call it, uh, will remove most of them, right? Will remove most of, most of them just by looking at the, at the labels. They don't need to look anything anywhere else, right? Can I get five more minutes? Fuck. So. <laughs> when when should when you should use GAN? So you should ask yourself: Does my does my uh, is there a structure in my label space? If the answer is yes, you should try to exploit it. The first the first thing that you should do is ask yourself: Can I construct a loss function quite easily? If the answer is yes. Use CRF. Don't use GAN right away because it's an open issue. It's hard to use GAN. It's hard to train. Most of the time, you get shitty results. You don't know even why. It's an open issue. Um, uh, if it's still harder, if it's still hard to define your loss function, by all means, try harder. Try harder. And, and if you don't succeed for a couple of years, maybe maybe it's okay then to use GAN. I mean, don't run to GAN as a first solution. It's tricky to handle. Most of the time, it's an open research issue. Believe me, we are in this research right now, and it's it's super complicated. The manifold, it's 
it's not there yet, right? So if you will take the, this concept five steps further and do structure prediction, this is like the super cool stuff that you can do with super predictions. I mean, this is the input. The input now is the labels, and this is the output, painting a real image from the labels, right? Label to image, label to image, black and white to color, um, aerial to maps, I don't know, this is like reverse problem, which is solved by Pix to Pix, which, which is also a, I think, Philip K is also part of this work. I don't sure, but okay. Questions? When I'm saying GAN, I'm talking about the Minimax game. I'm talking about the discriminator that replaced the loss function. Thank you.